Awesome. Hello, and welcome to the IPFS. Oh, hey, before we begin, let's see. Um, welcome to the IPFS weekly call. Um, let's see, it seems like we might have some sound problems. Jordan, can you hear us now? Uh, Jordan, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself, Jordan? I can hear you now, I think. I heard someone Yay, talking. and we can hear you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, For no some worries. reason, Zoom wanted to use my microphone as my speaker. I don't know why. It doesn't make any sense. That happens. Um, let's see. Here are the notes. And Jim will be taking notes for us today. So thank you, Jim. I don't see any um, items for us to go over. So we will begin right away um, with Jordan and Mark, and they will be talking about Tally Lab, which is a computer app that uses IPFS. So I'm really excited. Um, but before we begin, Jordan, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes, yes. excellent. Okay, um, so would you like to jump in? Yeah, um, cool. Mark is actually gonna be a few minutes late, but he will be joining okay. us here in a hot sec. Um, what happens if I try to share my screen? There should be a green button in the bottom. Oh, you got it, awesome. That works. Are you yeah. still just seeing the, okay. I'm actually gonna jump out of here and do a little demo here in a second, but um. So Tally Lab, we describe it as a data diary app, which a lot of people are like, what is that? And basically it is a way to collect and analyze data, which sounds really open-ended because it is. Um, a lot of people, when they start using it, their immediate thought is to use it to track health things, like symptoms or medications they're taking, um, supplements, things like that. But you can really track anything that is a thing that happens at the moment in time. So it's like a very open-ended time series data platform. Um, so you can track household chores or bird sightings or client hours you spent on client work, just really anything that happens at a moment or for a duration in time is fair game. Um, but what we kind of add on top of that is the ability to correlate those things. So whatever it is you're tracking, presumably you're tracking it because you wanna figure something out about your life, not just for fun. Although tracking data, totally fun on its own. Um, but we have a lot of tools in the app that allow you to then say, okay, you know, I've been tracking my chores and I've been tracking bird sightings and it turns out that every time I sweep my kitchen, I see a blue jay in my backyard. Cool. Like, Things like that. Obviously, that is a ridiculous example that I'm guessing wouldn't actually happen. But who knows? You could use Tally Lab to find out. Maybe there's like secret magic in the world that we don't know about. Um, okay, so in the sock, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to do a little demo, show you guys what Tally Lab is and what it does. Um, then we're going to talk about how we're currently using IPFS, which is in a somewhat limited way. And then we're gonna talk about how we'll be using it going forward, which is in a much more robust way. Um, so right now, let me um, get rid of this and go to a different screen. Um, so you guys are seeing Tile Lab now as it is rendered in a browser on a desktop. Most people use it on their mobile devices, um, primarily, but <clears throat> you can really use it anywhere. It is a progressive web app, so all you gotta do is go to tallylab.com slash app and use it. Um, so the example I'm gonna use here is um, a common one where you're trying to figure out if you have a food allergy. So the hypothesis here is that chocolate gives you headaches, which chocolate gives me headaches, so this is an example. Not, I have to eat a lot of it for it to give me a headache. Don't be too sad. <laughs> I only discovered this uh, like 
15 years, a long time ago, when I was actually working on the Lint chocolate website, and they sent us just like so much chocolate. They were like, hey, you're working on our website. We love you guys. Here's a ton of chocolate. And I ate so much chocolate, and I started getting migraines like every day. And it took me longer than it should have to figure out that like, you know, eating pounds of dark chocolate every day is like, you know, that's bound to cause anyone problems. <laughs> Not a good idea. Anyway. So that's the example we're going to use. And um, we've set up two collections of things to tally here, food. So in here I have uh, my chocolate tally and, you know, some other miscellaneous food things I might want to be uh, tracking as well. But in this case, the focus is chocolate and I have eaten chocolate 39 times since I started tracking it. And you can go see individual stats for a single tally. It'll tell you how long you've been keeping track of it. You know, this is actually not a good for this chart because it's for all time. But um, at most, I've eaten chocolate twice in a day. At least, I've eaten it zero times in a day. I'm very cautious about my chocolate intake. Um, and all I have to do is hit the plus to add the data point, and like the minus if I accidentally hit that the first time. Um, Jordan, I don't know about everyone else, but I can't hear you clearly. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, did that happen suddenly or has that been the case the whole has time? Has that been the case for anyone else? Yeah, it, it, look, it sounded like you were more far from the microphone. So maybe your microphone okay. got covered by your setter or something. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Me... But, but, but now I get, we can hear you perfectly. Now it's okay? Okay. Yeah, now it's better. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm tracking my chocolate and then under symptoms, I am tracking my headaches. Shocker. Uh, and similarly, I can just add a headache here. I could also have set up the headache <clears throat> tally to be a timer if I wanted to know how long my headaches lasted. And in that case, this plus sign would be a little play button when you hit play and it would start a timer and then when my headache ended, I could hit stop. Um, but the really exciting part is uh, we go over to the aptly named correlator here and look at the data charted together. So here's all the time I ate chocolate. And here's all the times that I got a headache. And look how amazingly correlated that is. I in no way doctored this data to look that correlated, guys. <laughs> so presumably your data would be a lot noisier than this, but for the sake of the example, I made it look pretty clear. Yes, it looks like not every one of my headaches is caused by chocolate, but every time I eat chocolate, I get a headache. Couldn't be clearer than that. Um, okay, so that's just a basic sense of how the app works. There's a lot of other detail in here, obviously. Um, but let me see, did Mark join yet? Hey, bud. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> um, why don't I go back to the slides and then Mark, you can talk. I'll, I'll man the slides and you can talk. Okay. Sounds good to me. Well, I can't see that. No slides yet. Okay. Um, Regardless, welcome, Mark. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. I'm just looking through the roster here who I know. Hi, Alan. Hi, David. Uh, hi, Mikhail. Hi, Portia. Uh, that's all I think. I apologize if I didn't recognize anybody else. Yeah. Full screen something. Hi. There Yay. we go. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. So, take it away. Okay. So, um, we knew we wanted to use IPFS for this project because of the decentralized nature of it, and because, um, for better or worse, it was just something that was adjacent to, but not directly related to a blockchain database. So we were just looking at something 
kind of high level, something that would just store data when you asked it to store data, retrieved it when you asked to retrieve it, if it was available and things like that. Um, and for the most part, everything was on the user's device, except for when they wanted to either switch devices or, um, you know, have a backup and restore from a backup if they uh, got a new phone or a new laptop or something like that. Or in the case of certain uh, mobile devices, if the OS just decides to randomly wipe your data, which has happened a couple times with iOS in particular, and just recently with Android, um, you know, if the phone's uh, hard drive space is getting low, I guess the local storage, um, not just regular local storage, not just like the key value store in the browser, but the index DB, all of those seem like they're just candidates for removal without asking the user or anything like that. So we had to build in a backup to make sure if something like that happened, then we'd be able to restore people's data. Because in the end, I'm sure Jordan mentioned this, this is meant to be a consumer app. Um, so it's, we make a lot of, uh, we put a lot of effort into making sure that people that aren't on this call, <laughs> that know about IPFS and know about this stuff can still use it. So this is, this is part of it. And uh, the slide that you're looking at here is basically what is stored on the user's device. So it's all encrypted using the um, uh, LibSodium uh, libraries. And uh, for those of you who are in the know, they're, they're diff Hellman keys, so we can restore them using uh, a 32 byte seed. Um, so you'll always have the same key pair. You'll always be able to encrypt and decrypt the same data set and so on and so forth. So that's that. Um, our steps here, so we use IPNS currently to do the backups. Um, we store a new IPFS key using the public key of the user, not the IPFS public key, but the diff Hellman public key. So the one that we generate, we call that the tally lab keys. Um, we, store, we use that as the name of the key, which gives us the IPNS name because um, they're just, it's, it's bundled there together. We put all the tallies and all the collections up in a nice uh, package, unpin the old one if it exists, add the new one, pin the new one, and then uh, publish it. So all that is well and good, except that as everybody knows, the IPNS can be slow sometimes. So um, Jordan, do you wanna talk through that workflow there or? Uh, go back first oh yeah okay um go back to the previous slide here yeah. yeah um so this is everything involved in this which is maybe not um that interesting to everyone at all but um it involves sort of like the entire process like across page loads of how we create a backup basically and um so um to to what mark was saying i feel like maybe i'm gonna go to the next one because i feel like it's kind of important, but um, we ended up making a couple of endpoints that we maintain on our own that allow some of these processes to continue even a, even across sort of like page sessions or view sessions for the user because they were taking long enough that we couldn't just like make the user sit on the page like here hang out for five minutes while we <laughs> while we make this call. So we created a, a sort of like intermediate layer on the server sort of traditional API endpoints that basically say, okay, start this process. And then as the user is continuing to click around the app and do stuff, um, we send, we're listening for the answers to these calls. And um, as soon as they come back, we, we proceed through the process. So that kind of looks like this. There's, there's a mixture of things we've created and IPFS, uh, what I'm calling native calls in here. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll take it from here. So the first one on the top of there, derive IPNS name, um, that just checks to see if the key had been created already, and if not, just return, or if not, create the key and return the name of the key, which would give you the IPNS name. And if it does exist, just return um, the name of the key. So we're not like, we're not doing anything to uh, to generate the IPNS name over again or to try to resolve it somehow. We just sort of cache it and store it. So that gives us a pretty immediate thing. And then the IPNS publish, uh, we just wrote a Node.js process, uh, an HTTP endpoint that just backgrounds that task 
and Tally Lab will just check in with it every few, you know every so often, and then when it finally uh, publishes the IPNS name, it will uh, it will let us know. Um, the other trick that we did was on resolving the IPNS name, we reduced the amount of um, peers needed to resolve it from the default of 16 down to three, um, which works for our purposes. Once we scale up a little more, we might have to increase that, um, but we're gonna tune that as we go. And that's, that's about it there. So that's what we're using IPNS for now in IPNS, if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, and what we're in the process of right now is, is migrating everything from our custom IP, uh, custom index DB store and IPNS to orbit DB. Um, so what that looks like, uh, orbit DB has different types of, uh, database. You know, there's a key value database, there's a document, there's a log, a feed. And, um, what, what it's going to look like is each tally is going to have its own orbit DB which is a key value store. So you can see um, the, what kind of an approximation of what the JSON looks like down at the bottom. And then if you look at the counts, the counts is its own sort of nested orbit DB inside of the key value store, which uses the document type uh, index by timestamp. So it's sort of an ad hoc uh, time series database uh, <clears throat> kind of embedded within the key value store. And we only store the address there and that allows us to do things like cache it, compress them, back it up, things like that. Next slide, yeah. Um, and the cool thing about Orbit is that the address is the Orbit DB addresses. You know, you've seen like slash Orbit DB, slash QM, blah, blah, blah. Those are relatively consistent because they're generated by, uh, they're a multi-hash of the name of the database, the type of the database, and the access control list of the database. So if two users in two completely different parts of the world uh, generate those same values and create a database, they're working from the same database. Um, and if you've ever used the Orbit chat client, you've seen people freak out about this because they're just, they, they'll download it, they'll run it in local host, and then they'll just start chatting with people everywhere and they're just confused and they say like, I'm just running this in local host, how is this happening? And that's how. So it's kind of cool. Um, so we're, we're looking at that as an alternative to the IPNS names. Uh, as far as uh, addressing the data in Talib. Next slide. Um, you know, there's obviously there's caveats to Orbit DB. The dynamic ACLs are tough because you basically have to clone the entire database if you want to change the ACLs since they're so, so baked in. Um, and, uh, you know, disclosure, I work with Haya in the Orbit DB team and smart contract based ACLs are coming. Um, though we're not sure if we're going to use them. We're not sure if that's the way we want to go with Tally Lab uh, directly. We, we sort of need to figure out a migration path with our own key pair system and that and how the ACLs might work. So we're going to explore that, um, but we're just not sure at the moment. Next slide. And uh, that's, that's basically it. So I guess we'll just open it up to questions now. And this is, we'll leave this up so you can just, know how to get in touch with us and there's a mailing list. If you're curious about following our work, you can do that. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> thank you, everybody. I see people clapping, it's very nice. Okay, questions. Um, put this on speaker view. If you have a question, if you just put it in a chat box, that'd be great. Yeah, so sure. See everyone. Right. Okay, so the question um, okay. is... Um, our, let's go ahead. See. So, Arkady, do you have a question? He said he's in a loud place. It's in the chat. I can read it if you want. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, uh, the question is, is there any interest in interopping with other tools like QRI? To that, I respond, what's QRI? I don't know what that is. Uh, so, so uh, QRI is uh, an IPFS-based uh, tool as well for dealing with uh, data sets and with perhaps in a somewhat adjacent and but not overlapping space. You should check it out. It's QRI.io. 
Okay, I'll, I'll definitely check that out. Um, uh, yeah, our, you know, I think the overall philosophy is sort of the high tides rise all ships philosophy. So we want, you know, if, if orbit improves, if IPFS improves, if QRI improves, then everybody gets to use it and benefit from all the tools. So it's definitely something that we'll, we'll, we'll look at for sure. Um, next question is from Johnny. Uh, Johnny? Okay. Ah, are you using RSA or EC keys for the tally PKI? Uh, they are there. I'll type it in there. Diff Hellman keys. Um, so Diffie Hellman is an algorithm. So you're using like Diffie Hellman key exchange to drive, and is it RSA or? Um, that's a good question. I believe it's. I'd have to look at the code again. I apologize for not knowing this right off the top of my head. <laughs> it's RSA. I was just looking at it. Earlier. It's RSA. There you go. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks, Jordan. Okay. And are those uh, per device? Do you have like a device key? Because uh, unless you're actually like, if you're bridging it over to each device or each person has the same thing, same, same uh, drive to the human key, then there is always the potential of a security breach that. So you really want to sort of actually have a de per device um, key, yeah. a paired key with that user. Just, just sure, as a, you want me to take a stab at, at answering this because we've we've definitely put a lot of thought into this, and uh, we're also open to the idea that we did it wrong. But uh, I'll, I'll try to explain what we did, unless Jordan, you want to try? No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what we do. On a, on a new instance of Tally Lab, if you've never used the app before to open it up, we just generate random keys. And we just say, okay, here's your keys. Kind of like what you know, <clears throat> any, any you know, Ethereum would do or anything like that. Um, but what we do, we say, if you wanna use the backup system, you have to <clears throat> go through this flow whereby you basically answer knowledge-based security questions that only you would know. And we, we thought really hard about which questions to ask and maybe we may be able to pull that up if people are curious but um what it what it means is that you answer questions until you have 32 bytes of deterministic information and that's used as the seed to generate those keys and we're clear that you know don't write these down this is stuff that should be in your memory um and we you know do some do some normalization on those to make it easier for people but once you get 32 bytes of a seed that's what generates your keys, and that's what would allow you to open up a brand new device, open up Tally Lab, regenerate the keys, and then start working with your backup. So there is a risk there that somebody might know the somebody else might know the answers to those questions, or those might get you know intercepted somehow. But that's sort of the trade off that we're making right now. Awesome, thank you, um, Davi. Cool. <laughs> Okay, uh, I was actually just like dumping a bunch of questions <laughs> as fast as I could. Uh, cool, this is really great. Um, should I just pick one question, or I'll, I'll should I try to like ask all my questions all at once? Go nuts, uh, man! Whatever you want to do. <laughs> all right, so I'm really interested on. Um, so first of all, this is great. I would love to have this for myself. I keep trying to track my own data, and it's so hard. Like. Please help us solve this problem. Um, any any interesting properties on the data model, or is, are is the data getting stored on Tally uh, just raw files for now? Huh. Um, well, I guess I, I have to be obnoxious and ask, what do you mean by interesting properties? Uh, like what? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So uh, what I'm thinking is is that in a lot of these other services, like the user or the developer always has to fight on how the data is structured in any each of these yeah. services, and then has to like make interoperability, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. There is this really nice opportunity with IPFS and more specifically IPLD for you to create like the data model, like the API, which is the data itself, mm. to access these data points, to make it nicer to build applications on top of it, to make it nicer to create visualizations on top of it. And, and I'm just asking like, if you are already had it there, if you thought about it, uh, if it's already there. Yeah, yeah, we, we've done work, and Jordan has done a lot of work in particular in making this as malleable as possible for people. So we're, we're not trying to shoehorn people in. Um, she, she did a lot of research on you know, like a competitive analysis of all the different other types of quantified life apps out there. And they really are specified to one thing. You know, it's like medication and symptoms app 
or um, fitness app, you know, things like that. And we, we tried to make the data model as malleable as possible so people can use it to track whatever they want and correlate whatever they want. Uh, I would add to that and say that, so the basic units in the app are, there's a collection, which is just a bunch of tallies, and then there's a tally, which is the thing you're tracking. And then inside of the tally is an, a single instance of that thing happening we call a count. And each count has data that you can associate with it. You can associate a numeric value with it. You can add a note. You can add, you, every, every count is, is a date. It's a timestamp, but you can also add an end stamp to it, which will make it a duration, right? Um, and as we go, obviously, like more use cases crop up that need more, you know, different things. And so we're we're constantly sort of thinking through how we're going to add things you can add to account. And so, like the first thing is going to be multiple numeric values. So you know, maybe you're tracking your runs and you want to add like miles to it. There's like a duration aspect to that. There's a mileage aspect, but maybe you also want to add like how I felt, like some some sort of you know, like subjective value. Um, so we want to, we want there to be multiple things you can attach to an individual account, but we, you know, we're trying to balance that against making it easy to set up and not, and not overwhelming people to set that stuff up. Most people are not data scientists and aren't like thinking about data models as much as I wish that were not true. They're not. Um, so it's like this, it's like this balance, you know, and, and what we want is for anyone to be able to set up any kind of um, data that they're looking to capture while at the same time having like stock templates where you can just install tallies that, you know, if you're, if you're tracking your runs, we can assume some things about what you're going to want to track about that. So here, just install that tally. And it's, a, it's a balance. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, like just having a start of like having a way to describe what is a data type more than just saying this is X yes. tomorrow. Yes. What is the schema? Can X transform into Y if another importer from schema to schema yeah, is applied and so on? And, and that's some really good feedback. I mean, you're making me think now, and I haven't thought about this before, but it would be nice to actually allow users to import their own data schema for a specific tally. This is how the status should look. This is what I want you to present me with when I add a new count. And that would be pretty easy for us to do. So that's, that's, a, that's a great idea. Awesome. Awesome. Um, before, yeah, go ahead. Go we, ahead. Are, we are running a bit short on time. So could we uh, okay. get Molly's question in, please? Yeah, I'll answer Molly's question a little bit. Um, well, actually, yeah, Jordan, chime in here too. We've, we've just started working with um, uh, behavior therapists, which is kind of an interesting uh, one to do. So... Uh, you know, my, my, my son is followed by a bunch of psychiatrists and a bunch of uh, what they call uh, applied behavior analysis people. Um, and, uh, you know, they still keep data in binders and, you know, draw line charts themselves with graph paper and stuff. So we're sort of like, hey, check this out. This might be useful to you. Uh, and it's and, also, to jump in yeah. here, it's also, I mean, it should be, <clears throat> maybe implied from how we've described it so far, but it's HIPAA compliant and it's GDPR compliant out of the box, like the way we've constructed it. We can't actually see anything that anyone is tracking, even as people making this app. So it's a great healthcare use case, you know, because we don't have to do anything special. It's just already HIPAA compliant. But go on, Mark. Yeah, no, that's um, good. Isn't it? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Portia. Awesome. Um, we really are running short on time, so okay. I really do want to get Molly's question in, please. Oh, that was Molly's question. That was my question. Oh, that was Thank your question. You guys. Yeah. Ah, my okay. question was, oh, um, like, stuff. what sort of... <laughs> sorry about that. So, oh, I, I, I am sorry about that. Apologies on my side. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and that, yeah, and that we, can, that we can actually just finish up, because that's more or less yeah. David's final question, too, is that's far in the health industry, so... Thank you, everybody, again, for the opportunity to show this to you. And Thank you very much. This was awesome. Thank you for sharing your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome. All right. Um, thank you very much. And um, I will see everyone next week. So have a great week. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right.